Hey everybody, springtime is in full swing right now and it's a beautiful and amazing time to be outside. The birds have returned north to make nests and lay eggs. There's flowers on the ground and in the trees and pollinators are out doing their jobs. Now, pollinators are a special group of animals that include species of birds, bats, and insects that do the very important job of helping plants reproduce and spread the beautiful diversity of God's creation. Now, one of the coolest pollinator experiences I ever had was joining a farmer. We went out to this piece of farmland where there were dozens of beehives all along the edge of the forest facing this open field. And so we all suited up in our bee suits so we wouldn't get stung. And we went out and I was surrounded by thousands and thousands of honeybees. I was a little scared, but I knew that the suit was going to protect me from getting stung. We opened up one of the hives and I got to see everything close up and how they make honey. It was really, really cool. And today we get a chance to do some of that together. Plus we're going to be visiting an authentic Dutch windmill and we're going to get to see over 100,000 tulips. So I hope you're ready for an adventure. Let's go. As a wildlife filmmaker and educator, I've spent most of my life exploring God's creation from climbing up mountains to canoeing through wetlands and hiking into forests. My love for God's creation has taken me on many outdoor adventures. In each episode, you'll come along with me as we explore this great big world God has made. I hope you're ready for an adventure. I'm Peter Schremer, and this is Hike and See. Well, today we are headed to Holland. Not Holland in the Netherlands, Holland, Michigan. It was back in 1847 that a Dutch pastor took 60 members from his church and went to start a new life in the new world. They ended up settling on the banks of Lake Makatawa along the coast of Great Lake Michigan. And one of the things that Holland, Michigan is known for today is tulip time. Now that was started by a biology teacher back in 1928 and today the whole area just explodes with the colors of over five million Dutch tulips. And one of the best places to see these tulips is at Windmill Island Gardens, which is where we're headed right now. Tulips are one of the signals of spring, and when you have over 100,000 of them, it definitely is springtime. Tulips are one of the icons of the Netherlands, and they send billions of these beautiful flowers around the globe every year. There's over 150 species of tulips with over 3,000 variations. So tulips didn't actually originally come from the Netherlands, but after they were imported in the late 1500s, they became very popular and created tulip mania. Yes, some of these flowers were worth more than 10 times the amount that a person would make in an entire year. Some tulips were worth more than some houses. That's one expensive flower. The people of Holland, Michigan wanted to strengthen their cultural ties to the homeland, so they got their own authentic Dutch windmill, Dizwan, which means graceful swan. 
It is the only authentic functioning Dutch windmill in the United States and the last windmill to leave the Netherlands. It stands at 125 feet tall, which is about 12 stories. Now, in the book of Genesis, the Bible talks about God creating animals according to their kinds and being able to reproduce according to their kinds. So what does that actually mean? Well, what it means is, is that animals and plants were created by God with the genetic potential to create diversity and variety. We look at the tulips here. They're all tulips, but look at all the colors and varieties of tulip, over 3,000 that are out there in the world today. If we look at the animal world, we look at dogs. They're part of the dog kind. You have all these different breeds of dogs in the world, plus you have species of wolves and coyotes. But they only give birth to other types of dogs. They don't give birth to chickens. They don't give birth to lizards. They're always within the dog kind. But there's a lot of diversity and variety because God has planted that genetic code in all of those animals. It's just one example that shows God's creativity and intentionality. That was so beautiful. I absolutely love visiting Holland, especially during tulip time. You know, flowers serve a very important purpose in the natural world. They help plants reproduce. But in order for flowers to help plants reproduce, they need to be pollinated. And that is where pollinators come in, like honeybees. Now, honeybees are an introduced species. That means they're not native to North America. They're native to parts of Europe but they were brought over here on purpose to produce honey and to help with pollination on farms. And why is pollination on farms so important? Because plants cannot produce fruit without pollination. Now there is over 2.7 million honeybee colonies in the United States today, and they're responsible for pollinating about one third of the food that we eat. So they're very important and special little creatures, and today we get a chance to see them up close and learn a little bit more about what beekeeping is all about. So we're with my friend Deborah Zahn Simmons, and she is a beekeeper. And so Deborah, tell us a little bit about why you love beekeeping. I love beekeeping for the bees. I got into it um, because I was fascinated by how they function how the hive works, how each member has their own little job and they all do it. And it's very therapeutic to watch. Um, if you have a tough day or something, you can go out and just sit and stare at them coming in and out of the hive. And it's just wonderful. So it's springtime right now. So what is going on in the hive at the moment? Well, at the moment, the queen has just been installed about three weeks ago. Um, they came from California, so they all also had a climate change that they had to get used to. And they are going in with frames that had some wax already built out, but they're cleaning, they're reorganizing, similar to if you moved into a brand new house and everything was in boxes. They have to take everything out of the boxes and find its place. So right now that's where that, what they're doing, and then they're building up with eggs and larvae and trying to build their population. And they're also bringing in food because they came with nothing. So what do you do to prepare to work in the hive and with the bees? So in the spring, we start with this three pound box that we've been given, which has about 15,000 bees in it. And we have to provide them the house and the mechanism for them to lay eggs and larvae and build up their numbers because they have to get to about 60,000 before they will give us any honey. Um, so we take this box of bees and we install it into the Langstroth hives, which are the square ones, and they have frames in there and foundation, which gives them a platform to be able to build off of. And then I go and put a suit on because bees sting and they don't ever know you. They are never your friend. And so you have to work with them and respect their need to protect their home. 
we take a smoker and we fill it with pine straw and get it going so that we can smoke the bees and give them a second or two to think that their hive is on fire. And with that, they then gather nectar and pollen because they are gonna to have to make an emergency exit, which gives them that nice full Thanksgiving feeling. Um, it makes them tired and more lethargic and not quite as easily angered. Okay, and with that, it's time to suit up. So what's the first step here now that we're approaching the hive? First step is to give the bees some puffs of smoke. Um, you can do that in a variety of ways, but we usually do the front entrance and the upper entrance. And then we slowly take everything off. We're going to use this as a lid. So when we set this box down, we'll put it crossways on here not to crush any of the bees. This is the inner cover and the upper entrance. And we're going to then separate the boxes, pick them up. And this is where the main activity was going on yesterday. This is Jim and he does not wear gloves when he is working with the honeybees. It is a personal preference. He also doesn't have a full suit on, but he does not have the same issues with the venom from the bees as say I do who has an allergic reaction so he does not mind being stung the eggs are normally laid in a rainbow type pattern in the center of the frame and then the outside edges are either filled with honey or filled with your pollens and stuff that have been brought in or it's called bee bread and that is very important for feeding the new bees. This little guy here, which is whiter, he is one that has just hatched out. He's a newbie. Right here we have capped larvae, and because of the coloration of the capping, we know that they are getting ready to emerge. You will find larvae, the white right in this area, it's not re quite ready to be capped over yet, so they're still being fed by the nurse bees. And then on the outside edges, you have your pollens, and they will be different colors depending on where they came from, and some honey on the very periphery. You can see the pollen on the back of this guy's legs. It's more of a yellow color. They've been bringing in a bright orange also. The worker bees are all females that cannot reproduce. So they're fed the royal jelly for a shorter period of time. So with the royal jelly, the worker bee's egg that has been decided to be the new queen will be fed royal jelly the entire gestation time. And that allows her to be able to breed later on in life. The worker bees cannot do that. They are the ones who do all the major work and nursing in the hive, and then eventually are the field bees, which you see coming in, that um, gather the pollen and the nectar and bring back. They have different stages of life. Once they hatch, they become nurse bees. They have five glands underneath their jaw that secrete the royal jelly, and they go around and just feed the babies. Then they become house bees. And at that point, they make the wax, which is from five slits on either side of their abdomen. And they then form the cells, they clean, they accept the nectar and pollen from the field bees and put it into the cells. Um, it's just housekeeping. And then their final stage, when they are ready, is to go out and be the field bee and to actually gather the nectar and pollen. They then bring them back into the hive and are met at the door by a worker bee that is not at that stage yet, and they deposit into a honey stomach the nectars that they have gathered. The pollens they actually bring in and they place them in cells. The, wor the worker bee that is the house bee at this time then goes and places the nectar in a cell and it is then fanned and 
prepared to be sealed for honey. They keep working with it until it is the right moisture content. The best year we've ever had, I got 768 pounds of honey. Last year, I got probably 130. So it all depends on the water content of the year. A flower can still be a flower and not have any nectar that's available to the bees. So if a summer is really dry, then the bees can fly out to the flowers, but they don't have the ability to bring back pollen and nectar because the flowers themselves dry up. A bee in its lifetime, which is only about six weeks in the summer, um, collects one twelfth of a teaspoon of honey. So anytime you drip honey on a counter, mm -hmm. that's pretty much a whole bee's life's work. There's the queen right over there. She is right now going around the cleaned cells that the house bees have done or the worker bees that are in that mm -hmm. stage of their life. And the red dot is simply for identification purposes. Obviously, she looks different than the other ones, but when you get into full swing with 30,000 bees in the hive, it's very difficult sometimes to find her. So we mark her with a dot. The queen will then go around and she will lay between 1,500 and 2,000 eggs a day. That is her sole purpose in life. She doesn't feed herself. She does nothing else but lay eggs. Now tell me, you mentioned that it's very therapeutic for you to come out here and watch the bees. Tell me, how do you sort of reflect and connect with God when, when you're out here with your bees? I think because of the fact that with the honeybees, it's just amazing how it all interacts, how they interact within themselves, how they care for everything, how they, I don't know how anyone could not believe in a creator when watching a system like this exist mm -hmm. and it's calming because it's just they all go in they all go out there's no fighting everybody just does what they're supposed to do at their particular time so i received a message from micah who's six years old and lives in indiana and he asked me why would god make bees if they sting that's a very good question none of us like getting stung it hurts and it can be scary. But bees need to be able to sting to survive in this world. They need to be able to protect themselves and their honey and their hive. But that's not the way God originally planned it. Back in the Garden of Eden, everything was perfect. There was no pain and there was no death until Adam and Eve disobeyed God. And then sin entered the world and everything changed. Animals began eating other animals and the creatures that God had created needed to adapt to be able to survive in a world full of sin. And so even though we don't like to get stung, it's what bees need to do to survive in this world. And despite living in a world full of sin, it's an example of the complex creativity of God's creation. Today, we got to see the beauty and diversity of the tulips. We also got to meet the amazing honeybees that pollinate and make honey. One of the things that I love most about honeybees is how they work together. Every bee has a different job, but they work together as one. Some bees are making cells, others are caring for baby bees, or they're making food, and some are out in the field collecting nectar and pollen. But every job is important to keeping the hive healthy and strong. If we look at Romans chapter 12, verse four, it says, for as in one body, we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. The body of Christ is the church, and the church has many members. And just like the hive relies on bees doing different jobs, God has given us different talents and abilities to serve the Lord and each other. And those jobs are opportunities to share God's love with the world. And just like the bees, you may have talents and abilities that God uses at different points over the course of your life. Knowing that you are part of something much bigger and that you have an important role 
and sharing God's love with the world is a very special and important thing to remember. Today was a lot of fun. I love the springtime because so much is going on outside. I hope you get a chance to explore and experience what's going on around you. Maybe you can plant some flowers, maybe even some tulips, or you could learn more about beekeeping and someday give it a try. These are just some examples of how you can get involved in God's natural world and help out in the pollination process. So now it's your turn to hike out into creation and seek our loving creator. I'll see you next time. 